Uh, I'm not going to ask a question of uh, Miss Don Nancy. Let me just say that. I'm sorry I can't pronounce your name. Uh, you're a key TAM lawyer, and as the author of the False Claims Act in 1986, uh, I'm glad that you're well acquainted with it because too often we find judges uh, doing damage to it from time to time, and then we in the Congress have to come back and and uh, clean up what judges interpret our law to weaken it. So I just hope you're aware of that. And as a judge, hopefully you can maintain it as a strong piece of legislation. Congratula congratulations, Judge Lochner, once again. Uh, I, uh, my first question is uh, pretty simple. Can you tell me how your time working as assistant U.S. attorney will inform you in your work as a judge? Sure. Um, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, before I started working as an assistant U.S. attorney, I had only limited familiarity with the criminal side of practicing law. I'd handled a lot of civil cases, including a lot of civil cases in federal court, but my criminal experience was limited. Working as an assistant U.S. attorney helped me get that experience very quickly and helped me feel very comfortable that I could handle everything from trying cases to the sentencing guidelines to all of the other aspects that you need to understand as a judge in the criminal system. In addition, I worked with crime victims. I worked with law enforcement agents. I understood that side of the practice. And I take that with me now as a judge. Those experiences have helped inform me and have helped make sure that uh, my decisions are based on the law, that I'm approaching issues neutrally, and that ultimately uh, my decisions are not based on any personal goals or preferences that I have, but rather the facts and circumstances of the case. And I'd point out that I had uh, later in my career many of the same experiences on the defense side of criminal cases and got to see that perspective as well. So my time uh, prior to taking the bench, I think has helped give me a balanced view of the work that I now do as a judge. My last question to you was based upon a quote from something you said at a naturalization ceremony. The Constitution was not a perfect document. In fact, it has been amended 27 times to try to make it better. And judges like me are still trying to figure out exactly what the Constitution means and how it applies to a particular circumstance. But this much I know. The Constitution and its amendments have established a set of core principles that have withstood the test of time. Other than through a constitutional amendment, does the Constitution meaning change with the passage of time? Senator, my understanding is that the Constitution has a fixed meaning. Sometimes it has to be applied to new areas. Uh, but no, I think there's a fixed quality to the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, this is not a get you, qu get you question. When I quote something you wrote uh, uh, maybe a few years ago, you were serving as president of Delaware, Delaware State Barn. You wrote an article discussing George Zimmerman's case. In that article, you uh, noted your respect for our judicial system and as both an attorney and U.S. citizen. You concluded your article with this statement. Sometimes things can be found to be legal or justified under the law, but just not feel like justice to some of us. As social engineers, we need to constantly push the law to be better. I take it from your statement that you think lawyers are social engineers. Do you believe that judges should also be social engineers? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Senator, uh, I uh, understand the distinction of the roles between a judge and a lawyer. Uh, that uh, quote uh, was referencing uh, lawyers as social engineers, lawyers and others in society uh, can be social engineers and uh, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, particularly uh, as uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, one of my heroes said that lawyers can either be social engineers or parasites on society. So I do believe that lawyers uh, have an obligation to use their skills to make society better. That's different than the role of a judge. The role of a judge is to be fair and impartial, to apply binding precedent to the specific facts of the case before them without personal view or bias. And if I'm so fortunate to be confirmed, that's what I would do. Yeah. 
I didn't think I'd have a chance to answer you a question, Nancy, if you'll forgive me by being personal for the reason I gave you. Uh, in 2012, you re represented the Brady Center for Prevention of Gun Violence. You signed an amicus brief supporting a ban on what you described as military assault style assault rifles. You also suggested that AR-15s are uniquely dangerous because of the feature of the protruding grip. Your briefs, so now getting to the question, your brief suggests that features like protruding grips or telescoping stocks make rifles more dangerous. Both generally make a rifle easier to aim, but the brief seems to say that this isn't as important for self-defense. Can you explain why you think that this is important for offensive but not defensive use of firearms? Thank you for the question, Senator Grassley. Um, I was asked to come on for the Brady Center um, to serve as local counsel, and I will admit that I am not an expert in firearms. However, I was involved with the brief and read the brief, which very, was a very measured argument within the confines of Heller, within the framework of Heller. Um, and I found, found the brief to have very persuasive arguments. Um, I will say that that particular assault weapons ban is still um, in force um, in Cook County. Um, so it has been upheld. A like ban was upheld um, by the Seventh Circuit. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I yield, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Grassley. I'm happy to yield to Senator Kennedy if you'd prefer uh, before a question. 